So I just want to introduce uh, Mr. S.P. Singh Parihar, who is the chairman of the Central Pollution Control Board, uh, which is uh, our country's uh, uh, nodal key uh, pollution watchdog. It's the enforcement arm of the Ministry of uh, Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. Uh, Mr. Parihar is an IS officer. Uh, and has served in many parts of government, including in the Cabinet Secretariat. And uh, Mr. Parier is a background in physics, particularly in nuclear physics, as I, uh, as I understand. Uh, so, Mr. Parier, I think we're going to follow the standard practice of 30 minutes for our uh, paper presenter, 10 minutes each for our discussants. Uh, where are our discussants? Uh, why don't you come here, because that way, uh, we can, they can see the we can, no, they can see the slides. The slides are up here, but we can see your body language reacting to the paper, and that's really part of the process as well. So Nat and Shom, can you please both uh, join us here? Um, and we're not going to do major introductions as usual because we have a biography of everybody uh, that's with you. Uh, so it's 30 minutes and then 10 minutes each for the discussions, and we like to leave at least 30 to 40 minutes for question and answers, which is very much part of the IPF process. So I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Parheer. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shah. Um, I'm indeed very grateful for this opportunity to be among such distinguished participants here. And uh, Professor Shah, of course, has given a very strict format for the discussion today. And therefore, I'm going to invite the distinguished authors to maybe present the paper over the next 30 minutes. It will be followed by discussions, making the remarks for about 10 minutes each and then we'll have time for discussion. So may I invite the distinguished authors to kindly make the presentation. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Parehar. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, let me quickly lay out what I'm going to talk about uh, today. This is joint work with uh, number of co-authors whose names are up there. Um, that's a provocative title. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is environmental regulation. Air pollution is, of course, not a problem that you solve, but it's a problem that you can significantly improve. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about some of the insights that I have at least uh, learned over about six or seven years uh, working with policymakers and working with data and academics uh, on this topic, regulation and environmental regulation in India. Uh, now, six years in some contexts, and, and Rohini has been working a little longer, is a long time. Uh, in other contexts, it's very little. Uh, so the chairman and the policymakers in this room have been doing this for their whole career. And so as I talk about this, you'll see some of those uh, different viewpoints uh, that might come in. <clears throat> So this is an outline of, of how I'll go through this. A little bit of a review of, and so this is primarily a review paper with some original work in it as well. Uh, I'll do a quick review of what we know about the health rationale uh, underpinning air quality regulation. Because we sometimes forget that the reason we are regulating air quality is not so we can hit some arbitrary standard, but because we can make a difference to, uh, to health outcomes. Uh, then I'll talk about regulation as it exists today, which is almost entirely command and control regulation. Uh, I'll give you some examples of technology mandates and bans and rationing in both the industrial and transport sector. Uh, I look at the problems here through the lens of a original evaluation of Delhi's uh, odd even vehicle rationing scheme, and I'll describe what that program was in a little more detail uh, when I get there. The objective will be to identify some of the weaknesses we see in existing regulation. There are also some strengths. And this is a limited time presentation, so uh, keep in mind that I'm focusing on the shortcomings uh, while acknowledging that's not necessarily representative of everything that, uh, that command and control has achieved. 
And finally, I'm going to move to some implications uh, and a sort of reform agenda that arrives out of this, uh, out of the data I'll show you. Uh, what this paper brings to the conversation, I think, is, is more analysis. But the reform agenda we've laid out is, is not controversial. At least, it's not controversial in the sense that several expert committees that the government has set up, most recently a 2014 committee that was formulated right after this new, com uh, new government came to power, have said similar things. So I don't want to claim that we're sort of the first people to, to argue this. So there's been a lot of work on health impacts of particulate air pollution, largely in the developed world. So a lot of these epidemiology public health studies have come from the United States and a few from Europe. I'm going to talk for 30 seconds about this paper that one of my co-authors, Michael Greenstone, uh, wrote a couple of years ago. And this is interesting, I think, for two reasons. It's interesting because it comes from China, and it comes from China over a 30 or 40 year period when both levels of air pollution and levels of development are very similar to what we see in India today. It also identifies a, a specific type of impact that we don't know too much about, which is what happens when you're exposed to sustained levels of air pollution. Uh, and that's a difficult problem to answer. Uh, and I'll just describe how this paper does it. So this paper exploits uh, a, a policy that China put in place, I think, about 40 or 50 years ago, which involved essentially saying that a river that cuts across the country, and that is the blue line you see there, the Huai River, everybody north of that river gets free heating uh, coal for, for heating purposes, and everyone south of that does not. And so essentially, this is an arbitrary division of the country into these two groups. In addition, at this point of time in China, migration was severely restricted. So you were not allowed to move uh, from one part of the country to another uh, without a significant amount of permissions and, and, and bureaucracy. So what this essentially did was it created a, an almost experimental setup where north of this river, uh, towns and cities as a result of this free coal uh, were much more polluted, and you see that in the data, and south of this river, uh, they were much less polluted. And so you had these two populations uh, placed in these two situations of high and low air pollution. And so the authors use this, and that's the graph on the right, and what they find is there's a discontinuity at the Huai River. Uh, there's a discontinuity in lifespans of the population north and south of the river. And the only variable that seems to change across, this, across the river is the particulate air pollution, uh, which is what you would expect when you're burning more coal. So everything else remains similar uh, north and south of the river, especially close to the river. And so incomes are similar, occupations are similar, other pollutants, water and NOx and transport levels are similar, but particulate air pollution is not similar. And the impacts they find are large. Uh, they find reductions in life expectancy that are up to five years per, um, per 100 uh, micrograms per meter cube increase in TSP levels. There's a version of this paper now that looks at fine particulates. But the point I want to make from this graph is that there is now increasingly strong evidence uh, of the health impacts of air pollution. And it comes from settings that are very much like India with levels of air pollution that are very much like India. Of course, there's now current work that's happening in India as well. This is a graph from a paper uh, that we published uh, two years ago, which does two things. It draws upon 456 ambient air quality monitors uh, from the Central Pollution Control Board and various state control boards. And so I think this is a uniquely detailed uh, data set in that sense. Um, and these are monitoring information from 190 cities. Some of these monitors have moved from place to place, so not every city is observed over the complete time period, but we have data from 190 cities. We combine this with an interesting paper that came out recently uh, by Sagnik Day at IIT Delhi, which looks at how you calibrate uh, satellite data uh, to a with ground level monitoring to obtain a fairly good measure of fine particulate air pollution. So what you can do is you can get air pollution levels across India district by district. 
And when you combine that with data from a bunch of uh, health impact studies, you see sort of life expectancy losses uh, between one and three uh, years, uh, and and that's the that's the gain in life expectancy you would get if you brought India's air pollution down to our own norms. So that's just to say that there is a there is a strong basis for this. Uh, there also seems to be evidence that this can be improved. Now this is a distribution of air pollution levels in different cities, in different countries and parts of the world, and what you will see is that. Uh, India, for example, has a number of cities at, at the top end of that spectrum, uh, and China used to, and China has now moved down, and if you look at Europe and the US, they are, they are further down, so there's more clustering of cities uh, at lower air pollution levels. So, yeah. This is all 2.5, yes. Uh, so, so, where does this come from? How do we, how do we get closer to what um, what, say, Europe has, has achieved from where we started. I think what's uncontroversial and what I'll try and show you uh, with some facts is that efficient regulation is going to require three things. It's going to require high quality data because you can hardly regulate and monitor what you cannot measure. It's going to require low costs and that's because compliance that is high, good compliance requires, uh, is greatly benefited by low costs. So the higher the costs you impose on regulated entities, the less likely you are to see compliance. It's going to need policymakers to design, to understand the incentives of the regulator and the regulated entities and design policy accordingly. And I'll give you a nice example of that. And most important, I think we need rigorous evaluation of new ideas. Because any reform agenda is rarely perfect when it starts out. Uh, at the same time, it's necessary. So I'm going to argue for more data explicitly used to understand this policy. So let's start with uh, examination of Delhi's odd even vehicle rationing scheme, which I think highlights many of these issues, which is why I'm using it as a sort of case study. So this is a, gr a graph of air pollution levels uh, in Delhi over, over a one year period. You could draw this for any year. This is 2015 to 2016. Um, and the program I'm going to describe in the next slide ran in the first half of January and the second half of April. And those are the two bands. But what I want you to look at, look at, take away from this picture is the incredible noisiness of this time series. So air pollution levels spike day to day. Uh, they have trends over time. Those trends are often short term and there are also long term trends. So it takes work to distill meaningful information from a time series of particulate matter measures. You also have a limited amount of money that you can put into monitoring. And so for most of our cities, we have only a few sites where we measure air pollution levels. And these are a set of monitors that the Central Pollution Control Board has uh, across Delhi and, and then some that are outside, Mark 3 there. But what's important here is that there's also a lot of spatial variation. So I showed you that time series variation. And then if you look across space at these different monitors, you'll find a lot of spatial variation. So for example, the first bar I have there is a monitor that sits next to an interstate bus terminal. So transport emissions there are extraordinarily high. Uh, it is therefore not necessarily representative of, of the city as a whole. And this speaks to a challenge in describing cities as being very polluted or less polluted or doing comparisons between cities because you don't have coverage of, of the whole uh, geographical area. And so you need to worry about, about where you're measuring something. And depending on where you choose to measure, you could produce a high number or a low number. So you have both spatial variation and temporal variation, and you're going to try and evaluate policy, uh, keeping that kind of data in mind. The third problem that we need to deal with is that even this technology does not ensure that you actually have good data. Uh, and this is a graph that shows you in blues where uh, are places where you had data for a certain percentage of time, the darker areas you had more data, and the greys are places you had uh, virtually no information. And this is all from Central Pollution Control Board monitors. There are some white areas where these monitors were essentially non-functional over this year. 
And so even those, uh, those graphs I showed you um, have significant missing data problems. So these are all challenges to researchers in doing policy evaluation, but they are also huge challenges to regulators in actually implementing, uh, implementing policy. This was ambient air pollution, and I'll get to how we use that data later. Uh, but actually monitoring emitters can be even harder. So remember regulation has ambient air quality as an outcome variable, but the interaction of the regulator with, uh, with the regulated entity is with people who emit air pollution. So that's say industrial plants or, or transport emissions. So, so it's the emitter that is, uh, that is of critical importance in this. This is from a really good study that uh, Rohini and Michael and others did in between, I think, 2011 or 2010 and, and a final publication in 2013. And this, I think, is a beautiful graph. So let me explain what this shows you. Uh, if you look at the top left uh, panel, panel A, uh, that's data from the Gujarat Pollution Control Board, which uses a third party auditing system to measure how much air pollution different plants are emitting. In other words, what happens is there are these accredited labs and they go to plants and they measure air pollution levels and they do this every quarter and then they come back and give that data to the regulator and that's the basis on which uh, you, you carry out regulation. And so when this project started, the data that regulators got looked like in the top left corner. And the vertical line I've drawn is the regulatory standard. And essentially, the data that these third-party auditors were providing as it said that every single plant is sort of between 5 and 10% below the regulatory standard. And so this is information that the regulator knows is not true because you just have to look at emissions from these plants to know that many of them must be out of compliance. But this is all the data you have to work with. And the reason this is happening is, of course, a problem with third-party audits, not just in the environmental sector, but also in, for example, the financial sector is that when an auditor is paid by the entity being audited, as was happening in this case, that plants were told they had to have an audit done, so they would hire an accredited auditor, but then they would also pay the accredited auditor. And so as you might imagine, the probability that you will be reported as failing a test when you are paying for that test is relatively low. So the bottom graph over there is data that came from a set of back checks not paid for by plants. And what you see there is this incredible spread of air pollution levels. A large number of plants are well out of compliance with the standard. There are also plants that actually do better than what they were reporting to the Pollution Control Board. And I think in some ways that's the most interesting because these are plants that essentially skipped doing the test at all. Because why bother uh, doing a test when you know what you're going to report? So you may actually be doing better than what you report, but your main objective is to hit this absolute standard after which you're okay. So you see a lot more compliance. You also see that the data in panel A at the top is essentially uh, meaningless. What this study did, which I won't go into in too much detail, was to say let's replace this auditing process by something which breaks this financial linkage. And now plants in Gujarat uh, pay money into a central pool administered by the Pollution Control Board, which then assigns a regulator at random to each plant and pays them. So you're no longer dependent on the industrial unit to get paid. This is now policy in Gujarat. And I think this speaks to something that uh, some of the discussion we were having earlier, is there a role for this kind of long run rigorous research uh, in policy making? And I think uh, this is an example of where that role has been fulfilled. And it's not taken the timelines, it's not had the timelines of two months or six months. I think we sometimes forget that policy is not necessarily made on a two month, six month timeline you often need multiple years before you can actually make big changes. This sort of problem is common everywhere. It's not unique to India. It's not unique to the industrial sector. Uh, we see this problem in sort of transport testing as well, where you go in to get tested for air pollution levels in your, in your car. And in fact, there's a great CPCB study which, which looked at pollution checking centers for vehicles across India, across Delhi, and they found all sorts of problems. So it's a similar sort of uh, relationship. And so the reason I'm showing you this is that not only is the air quality data difficult to work with, but the critical information, which is how much are the people emitting who you're regulating, that can be very difficult to work with under sort of existing. 
technology can help but it doesn't solve the problem now this is new information which i don't think uh, anyone has seen so i think it'll be interesting this is detailed data from a rollout of continuous emission monitoring systems in gujarat uh, in the city of surat now these are these are meters that the central pollution control board has now mandated across the country and in many ways this might suggest that there's a big step forward because you're no longer relying on individual labs or manual checking at occasional times you you basically have the equivalent of a smart meter in the plant transmitting this data in in real time but by itself what we find is it doesn't necessarily solve the problem and the way you see that is you see two things the graph at top is how long plants actually report this data so you can disconnect a meter and you see that plants do that data availability is extraordinarily low Uh, for something that you've put in for 100% regulation the graph at the bottom is the number of plants that report passing uh, the regulatory compliance standard and you see about 85 or 90% of plants are transmitting data from these meters which suggests that they are in compliance now when you compare that to the manual evidence that i have it uh, that i showed you uh, including a recent study that the central pollution control board did those two numbers just don't match up and so what you're seeing here is a variant of metering everywhere which is that the technology by itself won't do it what you also need are processes and you need those processes because you're trying to change behavior on an ongoing basis and i think that now gets to one central challenge uh, with command and control regulation or regulation in general is how do you put in place the processes to make sure that your one time rules actually work and so the odd even program in delhi is an example of the difficulty of doing that This was a program that ran in two rounds. It was essentially a driving rationing scheme. So it attempted to change the behavior of of drivers uh, by forcing them not to use their cars on particular days. So essentially the way it worked is if your car license plate ended with an odd number, uh, you could only use it on I think actually on odd number days and an even number plate could only be used on even number days. So it was attempting to cut uh the use of private cars by about half uh e- during the period of of this program so is it targeting transport emissions and this was in the day between 8 am and 8 pm with a number of exceptions which weaken the force of this program uh some of them are justified i think the big problem was with two wheelers because much of in delhi's transport road actually comes from these two wheelers so by leaving them out this program had problems but it speaks in part to to an issue with which regulators have with command and control is that sometimes you just have too many entities to monitor there's this amazing statistic which is the number of plants per technical staff in the state of maharashtra which is one of india's most uh, most industrialized and that's about 750 regulated plants per person and so you when you have numbers like that it's just physically impossible for manual regulation to work and and command and control which relies on that data to work uh there were fines for non compliance it's unclear if this was enforced now what was nice about the odd even program is that it attracted a lot of media attention so it attracted a lot of efforts to evaluate that program uh which i think in some ways makes it unique i'll talk about some of the problems or challenges with those evaluations but the very fact that you were trying to answer the question of did this pilot work it was set up as a pilot is is encouraging now there were very mixed reviews uh, of this program in fact these are diametrically opposite conclusions uh, that came from this program and i think but what what ties all these together the the common thread to all these is that they rely on that time series that i showed you and the time series you is easy to come to any conclusion on so the center for science environment for example looked at the level of air pollution two days after the program was initiated and the level two days before and they concluded within two days that this program was an incredible success but of course with noisy data like i showed you that can happen just by chance you could just as well have had a spike upwards and then you would have concluded the program is is a failure uh the evaluation i'm trying to show you uh is using a different technique it's using a difference in differences technique which i think uh helps get us a little more insight um and we found again mixed results but we found mixed results now over time and i'm going to talk about why i think that's an issue for for command and control regulation 
is how do you make it work over time? Uh, and, and so this was run in, in two, two parts. So I'll show you January results and April results. And you'll see they look very different, even though the program was exactly the same and the evaluation method is exactly the same. So one argument that you could make, which is this very nice piece that the journal Nature wrote about all of this, is that you got a lot of data out of these evaluation techniques. Um, maybe you didn't get sort of this one answer as to what, uh, what happened. So what, what do we do? We do the following. We compare changes in the time trends for uh, government monitors, CTCB monitors, both within and outside Delhi, before, during, and after the pilot. So this is what we call a difference in differences methods. And this is essentially what this is doing, is it's saying there are a whole bunch of exogenous factors that drive that time series. This includes whether you're, someone's burning crops in Punjab, whether the wind direction has changed, whether temperatures have changed, meteorology have changed. Now what's common among all these is they affect a large geography. So they affect monitors outside Delhi and they also affect monitors inside Delhi. So the point of looking at changes in time trends are to say, well, there's something that changed inside Delhi, which is that we introduced a new program. We introduced it for a 15 day period, so it didn't last forever. And then it was stopped. During that 15 day period, do you see these trends between monitors outside and inside the city change? And so that's, that's sort of what we do see. What you see is that uh, before and after this program, after you control for some of these monitor composition issues, which I won't get into, uh, you had similar trends. But during the program, these two diverged. And I think this graph uh, shows both April results, and which is at the bottom, uh, and air pollution levels are lower, which is why that's at the bottom, uh, and January results, which are at the top. And it's really quite striking what this program did. So the dotted line is, is outside Delhi and the solid line is, is inside Delhi. And what you see is at night, uh, these two seem early morning, these two seem to line up quite well. But during the day, they start diverging and Delhi air pollution levels are lower, especially in January. And then they start converging again uh, as night falls. And remember this program ran for between 8 a.m. And, and 8 p.m. You don't see, you see a little bit of a difference in April as well between sort of noon and, and 8 a.m., but it's a much less marked difference. And I think uh, this graph sort of uh, shows this much more clearly. Uh, so that one was the absolute levels of air pollution and you sort of see this, this, this divergence and then convergence o over time uh, of day. Um, and this is what we'd call the treatment effect. So this is running that difference in difference model for every hour uh, of each day uh, over this sort of 30 day period, 15 days before, 15 days during, and then 15 days after, 45 days. Uh, and what you see is there's this big drop. The blue line is in January. So in the winter when it was first implemented, there was this big drop during the day, which seems very clear here. Trends diverged during the day. And, and, and what's really nice is they sort of line up with the biggest drops are between 8 a.m. And, and, and sort of 5 p.m., which is sort of peak traffic times. Um, there's also this divergence right at the end, which is coming from, I think, a different program, which was a ban on truck traffic uh, during that period. But I won't get into that. Um, but we don't see so much of an effect in April. Uh, so why was it? So this is a problem, right? This is a command and control uh, effort to change people's behavior. And it seemed to have worked at least once it doesn't seem to be consistent, right? So, so it speaks to the ability of command and control to change things, but it also raises this concern of can consistently change behavior. One explanation is that maybe weather was the problem. Uh, when it gets hotter, air pollutants rise, and because air pollutants rise, it's harder to pick up changes uh, from ground monitoring stations. So it's possible that, that there was really no difference in how it changed people's behavior, but what we are seeing is a challenge in, in the data that's available to evaluate it. But there's also evidence that compliance, in fact, was lower. Uh, and that comes from a traffic survey that we did both in January uh, with a partner of ours, the School of Planning and Architecture, and in April. So this is direct measures of how many cars you see at traffic intersections and what sorts of cars. And we saw a big difference in compliance levels. In January, you did see reductions in, in traffic. Uh, in April, not so much. 
So, it's, so, so there's some evidence saying that it's not just a meteorology driving this difference, but it's also how much people paid attention to this program. And that's something you see in other parts of the world. So there have been driving rationing programs that have not run for 15 days. They have been put in place uh, on a more permanent basis for months and years. And they have produced, uh, in some ways, even worse responses uh, to this, to this uh, ban. Uh, in Mexico, for example, uh, there's a very nice study, and, and now an old and well-known study, which found that what people did was they bought a second car when this rationing was going to be in place on a permanent basis. What they would do is they would buy a second really old car with the right number plate. And so what it essentially did was instead of using your new car on both types of days, you would use this very old car, which you bought cheap, on, on the day that you, that it didn't match with your with your number plate. So you would, if, it, if you had an odd number plate, you would buy an, yeah, an even numbered car. And so actually this pushed up the age of the vehicle fleet and it actually led to an increase in air pollution. Why am I bringing up these examples? I'm bringing up these examples because the, the point I'm going to make when I get to sort of how we might reform things is it's very hard to change behavior. You, it's possible to tell people to install equipment once or, or make a single change. All cars have to be manufactured a particular way. But when it comes to changing behavior, both when you're monitoring uh, regulated entities and when you're sort of trying to change things, uh, that gets very hard. And so you see these examples in other settings. There have been efforts to ban uh, industry within, within Delhi. What has happened is those plants have moved 500 meters outside the Delhi border. So you achieved your ban, you didn't necessarily achieve, uh, achieve the impacts you wanted. This, I think, is another very interesting graph. So this is uh, original data from a survey of over 1,000 industries that we actually did with the CPCB. And what this is, is it's a box plot of particulate concentrations of emissions. Uh, with, a vert with the horizontal line being the emission standards. Uh, for plants with these five different types of mandated abatement equipment. And what you see here is sort of striking. The, the mandate, the command and control mandate that is easily enforced is install the right technology. And so that's something you can check and, and everybody has it. If you were using this and if you were maintaining it, everyone would be, would be within, uh, within limits, but we don't see that at all. And so, you know, you see that as well. Um, and one of the reasons why this might be particularly difficult is this issue of how do you impose uh, penalties on plants. And so this is a, a related but not identical problem. Uh, regulators have the ability to enforce very strict penalties, but shutting down plants is costly. So these penalties are only used for extreme uh, violators, which means that if you're uh, violating only slightly, you often get away. So I have two more slides in 30 seconds. So I'll, I'll tell you what we think might help reform things. So how do we meet these two objectives? Two examples uh, that, that are currently being thought about and which I think are therefore particularly interesting. One is to say, why don't we try experimenting with market-based regulation? Now, market-based regulation has challenges and it has benefits. Uh, one of the ben sets of benefits that it has is that it requires high compliance, high transparency, uh, and it reduces costs. And this is data, uh, this is a model using data from the city of Surat. Uh, and what we find here is this is from that 1,000 plant survey that you have potentially a 55% reduction in costs if you allowed plants to trade with, between each other uh, relative to command and control. And there's other previous work which shows the same thing. So at least ex ante, when you look at this data, it seems there are huge benefits to markets in costs, but also on those other questions of information. And I'm going to close with this, with this scheme that I hope you'll visit the website on. Uh, this is something that, the Mahara that we've been working with the Maharashtra Pollution Control Board on. And this is a very simple but potentially powerful idea. This is to say, let's take that regulatory data which sits in PDF files and registers in offices where no one sees it. We'll put it on the website and we'll rank plants on a one to five star rating. That's it. There's no new regulatory incentives or penalties. Uh, but what this does is it fills this information asymmetry. Plants now know what their competitors are emitting, which you never did earlier. And the public knows what plants are emitting. 
And so what, uh, what we're trying to see is whether this by itself uh, both increases data quality because now everyone's interested in making sure that they are rated the right way and reduces air pollution. So I'll close there um, and you know we can discuss things. Like that. Thank you, Anand, for a very insightful presentation. And it's really taken a very hard and a lot of work to do this kind of work. Um, may I now invite Dr. Somanathan to make his remarks? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so thanks, Anant, uh, for a great talk. Uh, I enjoyed reading the paper also. And I really want to commend the authors for having done a lot of uh, really thorough, careful, um, painstaking empirical research um, on a number of different issues related to air pollution um, in India. Um, and, uh, and I think that all of you have seen, um, basically, uh, you have some idea of, of uh, the kind of work that's done and the, and the kind of effort it takes to go and, and uh, put all this data together over, you know, and it's, it's, it's many years of work and it's being really, really careful. And I think that's, and you can see the value of that. Um, well, you've seen it yourself, right? It sort of, it kind of speaks for itself. Um, so I, I won't really comment on the on the empirical studies. Um, I don't think that's that would be very useful here. Um, let me just turn to the policy section, um, which makes three recommendations. The first is that there should be reliable and transparent data and monitoring. The second is that regulatory design should be incentive compatible and economically efficient. And the third uh, suggests piloting and evaluating the impact of new policies. So I agree with all these recommendations, um, although I, I have some reservations about the third one in the manner in which it's currently stated, and you know, I'll come to that if I have time. Um, well, I mean, basically they're kind of unexceptionable rec you know, recommendations. I think that we would, everybody would agree, right? So, so let me just say that, that I think that what, what, could, uh, what could improve the paper is, is, uh, is to sort of have a conceptual framework that organizes it. Um, and because I felt that in reading the paper that the recommendations in section three don't really flow naturally from the studies reported in section two. Uh, rather, they seem to have been sort of decided, uh, you know, a priori uh, or on the basis of other considerations and then kind of justified with some examples. Um, so let me just give, me, give, me, give you some thoughts about, you know, some kind of organizing framework. Uh, so let's just step back and ask, you know, why is the pollution situation so bad? And why are our regulatory institutions as weak as they are, right? So Anand gave you that example about the Maharashtra Pollution Control Board where you have one person to inspect 750 factories or something, right? Uh, so that was from a study that the Center for Science and Environment did a few years ago in which they document basically the, the manpower needs of various state con pollution control boards and how they're you know, really inadequate. But of course, it's not only manpower, it's basically resources, right, money. If you have too small a budget, you can't really do it. Anyway, let me say, why do we have some of the worst air pollution in the world and some of the worst water pollution, et cetera, et cetera? So one reason is simply population density, right? This is kind of obvious, but people somehow seem to forget about it. So what's our population density? It's about 400 persons per square kilometer, right? That's compared to a world average of 56 persons per square kilometer. Or if you look at the world country median, it's about um, it's about 90. So R is, ours is about four and a half times that of the median country in the world. Our population density is about 12 times that of the United States, right? Which has a population density of about 33 uh, people per square kilometer. So that will just mean that you know if you didn't regulate the pollution, you would get a lot more, right? You'd get a lot more because a lot more people. 
but there's another aspect to it, which is, I think, where the economics comes in a little bit. So if you take any pol given pollution externality, the marginal external physical damage from that po additional pollution is likely to be 12 times as high here as it is in the United States because there are just 12 times as many people, right, to, s to suffer that damage. There's a countervailing factor, which is that per capita income in India is low, and so the value of the marg the value of that external marginal damage per person must be correspondingly low, because each person is able and willing to pay less to avoid that damage because the income is much lower, right? So, or if one is looking at externalities that reduce productivity, right, say labor productivity, then again, because labor productivity is roughly proportional to income, the loss of productivity must be correspondingly lower in India on average compared to the US. Right? So our real per, cap per capita income is about 12% of that of the US right, last year. So if you take both these factors into account, the population density is much higher and the real per capita income is much lower, you can put them together, you just multiply them, right? The aggregate marginal external damage, therefore, from any given externality can be expected to be about 12% of that 12 time factor of population density, which means that it's about one, you can expect it to be 1.4 times that of the US for any given externality, right? Uh, so, of course, this is just a back of the envelope calculation. You shouldn't take the numbers very seriously. But the point is that, you know, there are orders of magnitude here. One of them is going in one way, which is the, the income measure, and the other is going in the other way, which is the population density measure, and roughly we should expect them to cancel out, right? So, in terms of, order of mag orders of magnitude, we should expect the, that we in India should be, should be, I emphasize, willing to pay about as much at the margin to deal with any given pollution externality as the US, right? However, of course, it's clear that pollution is vastly worse here. And why is that? Well, just look at the resources devoted to regulation, right? The US EPA, when I last looked at some website, had some 18,000 employees. If we look at the Central Pollution Control Board, it's about a few hundred, right? Uh, then we just heard about the situation at the state pollution control boards. Again, they're also very under-resourced, right? We have much more pollution also because we have devoted only a small fraction of the resources to regulate it, right? Although, as I just said, that in terms, if you just look at the marginal external value of the marginal uh, damage from any given externality, you shouldn't expect it, you know, our priority to be, to be very different. So why is this, right? Um, and there's an obvious answer to this. Um, I wrote a paper about this a uh, few years ago. Uh, it's that in a poor country, fewer people are aware of the harms from many externalities because they don't have A, the necessary education, and B, they don't have the necessary information either, right? So the demand for environmental regulation, the public demand from the general public is lower than it would be if people were well informed, right? And politicians in the final analysis respond to the demands of the public, however imperfectly, right? And there's also, which is I think really important here and comes back to the first recommendation of this paper, which is there's a feedback loop, loop from regulation to information to more demand for regulation. If you have little regulation, you know, you have under-resourced regulators, then you have very little monitoring. If you have very little monitoring, you have very little data, which means you have very little information about pollution, which means then, then there's low public demand to do something about it, right? So that's, uh, that's the first you know, recommendation of the paper. Increase environmental monitoring and make the data transparent. And I think this is really important. And uh, if we can make progress in this direction, then it can start off a virtuous circle of more awareness, more demand for regulation, more resources given to the regulator because of that public demand. That means the regulator will have more capacity, there'll be more monitoring, and so on, right? So I think that's something that, that uh, really would help if that key thing can be started. And maybe one way it can be started is that the regulator, whatever the, even though they're under-resourced right now, if they can, whatever resources they have, if they, they can make that data really publicly available and kind of m make it very easy to use for the public, I think that will help. Okay, so coming to the second recommendation uh, about re designing regulations well, and we saw lots of examples there where regulations could be better designed. 
uh, but the, the, again, the underlying problem is that if regulatory authorities have starved of resources, then they just don't have the personnel, the qualified personnel who have the time to sit and do this, right? It's always crisis management. You're jumping from one thing to the other. So I think that's one possible way out. Uh, I'm sure that other people have ideas as well, that the center and the state governments could basically levy a fee on all industries just as a fixed fee, right, as a percentage of turnover or something. Not unrelated to pollution, just as a percent of turnover, and then you just basically earmark this for the pollution control boards at the states and at the center, and and that fee should be sufficient. Basically, if we if we believe that uh, back of the envelope calculation I did, that fee should you know basically mean that the budget of these regulatory authorities should be maybe about 20 times what it is today, right? If we want efficient regulation, in the sense of uh, internalizing uh, the externalities fully. So, uh, and if we believe the U.S. is a reasonable benchmark, maybe it isn't, but who knows, okay. But at least they have much less pollution than we do. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, well, of course, I mean, th that's, I think resources is one thing, but then, of course, there are also incentives, right? People have to be incentivized to do the right thing. I'm suggesting that to some extent, if you make the data transparent, there will be some feedback processes in the political domain that will help with this. Uh, also, we should, we should, of course, I completely agree with the point that was made in the study about uh, giving the regulator more flexibility to, to, uh, to make smaller penalties, penalties that are sort of com commensurate with the violation rather than either nothing or an extreme penalty. Right, that's important. Uh, we also should, basically, the law should also sort of require that the, that when new rules and standards are set, if you give the regulator more flexibility, they should also be charged with setting the rules, setting the standards on the basis of the best available evidence, right? The best available scientific evidence. So, that, so the benefits of any given rule in terms of health and other benefits should be with reference to the best available scientific evidence. Right? I think that it's true that people, you know, you might say that, well, this is a non-starter, right? I mean, industry will lobby against it because they're not going to want more regulation. And, and of course, to some extent, that's true, but th there's, it's always the case that there are more technically advanced sections of industry that will benefit from more regulation because they're better at dealing with it than their competitors, right? So, and, and also, industry is suffering in the current environment. Again, that's in the paper. Anand didn't really refer to it much, but it's in the paper. We have, in effect, regulation by the judiciary by default. We have that because the, because the, regu the executive is starved of resources, pollution gets to a crisis point, right? People go to the courts, the courts then do something, and typically they do something draconian at that point, right? And this is really bad for industry because the whole process is unpredictable. You cannot make investments ahead of time, right? You can't plan for this. And, uh, you know, so industry, in fact, could be better off, at least as a whole, perhaps, uh, if you didn't have this stop-start thing. Um, and I said, I don't know whether my 10 minutes is over, otherwise I can, I can just spend one more minute. Um, the, 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 the last point about uh, piloting new schemes and conducting formal evaluations, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little leery of this. And, uh, in, in principle, it's a very good idea, and we saw some really excellent examples in the study here. But we should remember that there are always costs of doing these things, right? And we're we're operating in an environment in which regulators are highly resource constrained. So uh, not only in terms of in terms of money, but really in terms of time, right? How many things can you do if you're sitting in one place and you have you know so many responsibilities? And the problem is that it can suck up a lot of resources to find out things that are either obvious or only valid in very particular circumstances, right? So there are usually very many aspects of any given regulatory problem, right? Any given pollution problem, right? Many different dimensions of this. And you have to make a decision about all of those, right? Many, many different things. So you have to tweak on maybe, you know, 35 things. You have to decide what's the optimal thing to do in this dimension, in this dimension, in this dimension, in this dimension. And with a statistically rigorously valid, you know, study like a randomized control trial, for example, or but there are other methods as well, you know, you basically are limited to essentially, if you want statistical power, you're basically, at the end of the day, you're limited to dealing with one or two or three dimensions, 
right but in the real world people have to deal with very very many more and 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 they do need to make those decisions as well as good as as well as possible so if you take resources away because you're focusing on this particular thing it can end up being harmful so i i want to say that look i i do think that being careful about piloting and evaluation is a very good thing but i'm not sure that the way economists do it uh is necessarily the way that it sh should be done most of the time so i'll stop there thank you very much mr swaminathan um dr nathaniel please yeah. thanks very much um and thanks to shakar for the invitation to speak i um I'm currently with Environmental Defense Fund, but I spent uh, many years in academia, um, and it's always nice to come back and be able to be a discussant on a on a great paper like this one. Um, so I, I, you know, I think this paper is uh, quite exciting from a research perspective in terms of the way the authors, over many studies, have been able to exploit uh, really interesting uh, natural experiments, uh, have been able to design. Uh, control tr randomized control trials have been able to design experiments and and really take advantage of interesting data and I think it shows in the results some of the results that are not presented so that's really interesting to read and it's also I think quite policy relevant so I thought I would uh, spend a, just a couple minutes w with a couple of thoughts on quick thoughts on research and then I think perhaps focus a little bit more on the policy conclusions as some did uh, and then I can't help uh, resisting uh, adding at the very end a, a point about political economy which was also part of what I focused on uh, as an academic and what I think about in my in my day job um, uh, at Environmental Defense Fund so first on research um, as I said I, I think the research is quite interesting uh, really interesting I mean the the way the richness of the data sets and the way that uh, in many different ways some of these uh, simple but very well deceptively simple very powerful uh, diff and diff kind of approaches are being used uh, and really interesting data being found I think is quite interesting I think on the I, I think a couple of thoughts if I were going to push a little bit I know m most of the studies have been done but on the odd even study you know one is left with a little bit of a yes but um, so there's okay it's interesting that January worked and April didn't and you have the beginnings of a story about why that was um, but it would be good to see a little bit more uh, and I think the Davis paper you mentioned does that. One of the reasons the Davis paper is, is interesting is because Lucas really dug into, okay, why wasn't there an effect? Oh, look, you know, you can, we now understand more about behavior. Um, so I think we, we want, when we do this sort of research, we want to know whether it's atmospheric conditions or whether it's behavior that, that is the cause for the, 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 the policy not to work. So I'd encourage you to keep digging into that. And it looks like you have some data on traffic that could help you tease that out. Um, on the 2013 paper, I, I mean, I think this paper on inspections in Gujarat, which which was published in the QJE, uh, is really fascinating. Um, I was interested to learn the question I had was, well, are, did they do it, <laughs> and what what's what's happened now? It sounds they did. So I would I would actually make that point in the paper um, because I think it's an important point about the durability of policy. Um, and I realize it's never easy to publish a second paper on the same topic, but it would be surely interesting to see whether those effects have lasted. Um, because of course the policy relevance of it will be, um, did we do we still see all the impact, or or maybe it's a January to April effect, right? Maybe maybe there's a new way to get around the inspections that have been put in place. Um, so while that might not be as sort of sexy from a journal point of view, it would be great uh, great to see. Um, so those are the points on on research on on policy. The paper makes uh, three recommendations, as some said, and maybe I'll just go through each of those uh, in turn with sort of my own spin. I think, so the first is, um, I, would, I would sort of characterize as information is important, although not just information. Information is not, uh, not enough um, by itself. Um, and, uh, but, but I think there's some really good discussion about SIMS, the importance of monitoring data, the importance of SIMS data. Um, I guess the, the, the reaction I had, the main reaction I had was thinking about that very interesting star rating uh, approach that in, in Maharashtra that you put up at the very end and had to sort of rush through. Uh, it very, it's really interesting. I got a chance to see the State Pollution Control Board present about it on, at a conference on EPIC on Friday. Really interesting, quite innovative, um, but also one wonders how effective it'll be. Uh, you know, maybe it's a first step. How effective will that be? And, and I think it'll be really interesting to see the evaluation of that, of that policy. If we think about other 
roughly similar examples. Uh, you know, I'm from New York City, uh, and there's a restaurant rating system, A, B, C, you know, um, which is sort of similar. It, prob it probably chops off the lower part of the distribution. Um, I don't know how much effect it has above that. In other words, it's pretty effective at getting rid of the worst the worst offenders. Um, I think something similar has happened with some of the examples of making information like that available in the United States and elsewhere. Um, so it'd be interesting, it'll be interesting to see your results and I hope you'll look at an evaluation of how much importance that information has by itself. Maybe it just sort of chops off the, the worst offenders. Nobody wants to be one star, but you know how much does it do relative to the kinds of standards that are there? That'll be interesting to see. So that, that point about information is, I think, a very important one. That's, that's the first point. The second one about incentive compat compatible policies, I mean, I would characterize the main takeaway here as being um, all policies create incentives. The question is just what? What are the incentives? And are, they, are you trying to create those incentives, or are they unintended in, uh, incentives that are being created? Uh, and I think some of the most interesting examples in the paper um, are about the pervasive importance of unintended incentives. So, for example, the incentives around reporting um, and, uh, and auditing, when you, before the pilot study in, in Gujarat, um, you know, when there were third-party auditors that were paid by the polluters, uh, that creates incentives to, as, as you saw in that data, that creates incentives to, to say, oh, yeah, sure, every, every plant is just at the standard, just below the standard. Um, so there are incentives there, and understanding what they are and showing what they are, I think, is valuable. Um, the, the, the picture that you put up, and again, had to, had to go through quickly, but that box plot of pollution basically shows that everybody, all, all the plants in that data set have the right pollution control equipment installed. If you go to the plant and you look, there's the technology. It's right there. Um, but if you look at the emissions, the emissions aren't going down, and so that tells you again about the incentives are all around technological standards and the presence of uh, equipment, but you're not monitoring the outcome, then that's going to create a certain perverse incentive. Um, and then the enforcement. I think perhaps one of the most interesting stories uh, or points in the paper, um, which is a fairly small one, but I think is really important, is uh, the importance of enforcement of penalty design. Uh, and Anant, you mentioned this very quickly, but I'll just go over it a little bit more. Uh, the idea is that if, you, if, if the only penalties that are available to the regulator are draconian in nature, close the plant, um, then the incentives all point against using that, except as a very last resort. Whereas if you have more continuous penalties for non-compliance, you may get better enforcement because it's not a sort of life or death situation every time. Uh, and that's a point that's made in the paper, and I think it's a very interesting one. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the major point, perhaps, around that, you, that I think, or one of the major points you make, which you also uh, say, got to at the, at the very end, is if we're thinking about incentives, how do we design policies that create, you know, act, that deliberately create the kind of incentives we want to align um, the economic incentives of uh, actors and polluters and emitters with the social incentive, uh, the social goals of reducing pollution. Uh, and I think uh, it, is, it is right to point out the successes that uh, we've seen elsewhere in the world um, from market-based regulations. Um, I've spent a lot of time studying the sulfur dioxide program in the United States, which was the first large-scale trading program. Uh, and you, know, you said at the beginning, and not, uh, air pollution problems aren't solvable. Acid rain in the U.S. was solved by the, uh, in large part, by the acid rain trading program. If you look at maps before and after, just 20 years apart, of acid deposition, acid rain from sulfur dioxide, huge change. Um, as a result of this very economically efficient, very effective program put in place, that by creating a trading program, a market for pollution, created the right kind of economic incentives to reduce emissions uh, at, a, at a very low cost. And you, you cited that, um, and I think that's a powerful example. The only other point I would make about markets, and that you might, might be worth making in the paper, um, given your review of all the different market approaches, is the diversity of approaches that have been used to designing market-based instruments. 
So economists sometimes make the mistake of talking about them as if it's a single approach. It's a class of approaches. And the way that market-based regulation has been implemented in practice has varied tremendously according to the priorities and the needs and the goals and the objectives of the regulators as well as the context. So I think that diversity is important to keep in mind as you think about uh, lessons. Uh, I'm almost out of time, but I'm also almost out of comments. Uh, the, the third point very quickly is the piloting point. Uh, I do think that's a really interesting point. Um, it's kind of consistent with the theme around information. You not only need information around uh, data and monitoring, you also need information about what works. Um, and I think it's very interesting to take advantage of the, India's federal system here to have uh, the, the variety of efforts going on in the state. I take Sam's point about resources, but I think when you have the, S, the state pollution control boards that can make some of those pilots, you can spread those resources around. Um, so very quickly, I think the final point on uh, political economy, you know, this is, I mean, rightly a paper about uh, policy and data and research, um, but I can't help thinking that politics and sort of political economy are, are absent from the paper. And I think if there's one thing the experience of, of not only incentive-based but other policies has shown, it's going to be really important to get stakeholder support uh, on, on, on board. I do think the record we have for economically efficient policies shows that stakeholders will come on board, uh, that they will see the advantage in some of those policies, um, but that will be the challenge in terms of getting this implemented. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nathaniel. Uh, we are close to 11 o'clock when we are supposed to wind up the session, but uh, we do have some time for comments, observations, questions. The floor is open. Yes, ma'am, you could go ahead, please. Um, uh, Anand, um, my sense is that the dominant source of pollution, of winter pollution at any rate in Delhi, is the burning of crop residue. What is your policy recommendation for that? I can say a couple of words and then. Uh, uh, maybe more questions and then we'll answer. Maybe take a few yeah, more questions. Yeah. Please go ahead, yes. Uh, thanks. Very, very interesting presentation. I like the, the discussion's comments. Uh, but I want to go back to basic principles. I mean, pollution is your classic externality. It's a textbook case. And we also know from the textbook that the goal is not necessarily to eliminate pollution, but to maximize welfare, uh, because it is uh, such an externality. And the first best way of doing it is with a tax, ta to tax pollution. Now, clearly, that is not what's been either proposed or undertaken here. But it is curious that you went all the way to the uh, They started off by looking all the way to the other end, which is this command and control mechanism. And the point about the command and control mechanism is not just that there are problems with compliance, as you very nicely pointed out, but that even if there was perfect compliance, it could have a huge welfare cost. You have the wrong incentives for people to to cut back uh, uh, pollution. And I, I think it would be useful to just to get an estimate of how much of a cost there is to using this command and control mechanism as opposed to the first best uh, mechanism. And I think there might be a, a, a clue to that because of your comparison with the cap and trade mechanism. That's closer to a, a market mechanism that gives us a, a, a sense of how far off we are in trying to use command and control mechanisms, not to mention all the other problems that you pointed out, which is the compliance and uh, the, the lack of uh, political support. Uh, I'm Rashmi Banga from Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, I'm not a climate expert, but neither are our policymakers, so I take some confidence uh, in speaking today. I want to compliment uh, the author because I think it was a very interesting paper. And I've always wondered about this odd and even whether, uh, you know, if you put a rigorous analysis uh, to see the uh, benefits, whether it has made an impact or not. And I think I saw that in the paper uh, today. Uh, my suggestion would be on policy recommendations because uh, uh, I would also like to know, you know, uh, countries like Thailand and Singapore have tried this out, whether that worked in those countries or not. And uh, also, it will be very interesting to see what are the new thinking in terms of uh, pollution and climate change. In the Secretariat, we are now championing regenerative development, which is not climate mitigation or climate adaptation, but it is climate reversal. So 100 solutions have been put forward uh, in terms of changing the way people think about climate. 
and how you know way, ways of producing can um, uh, small changes can be made in ways of producing which can lead to uh, a lot of benefit and maybe uh, it's important to start sensitizing uh, general public in terms of the uh, implications or uh, of, of climate change or also of this regenerative development ideas so my suggestion would be if you could look at those and also you know talk about them and also some successful examples around the world uh, which have helped in uh, controlling the pollution thank you Uh, just I first want to thank the authors and thank Anand. I think that this was like a model IPF paper. I really, really enjoyed this because it's built on many years of high quality work and brought together now in a forum where we have policymakers to actually take this to take this to practice. So thank you so much. Um, so I think just one comment, one question. I think the comment was echoing uh, Soam's, uh, Soam's discussion, which is I thought the presentation of impacts was excellent, but there was no discussion of costs. And I think you know it would just be really important both for the paper and for policy um, to just kind of go back to what Shanta also said, right? which is do we have any mm, any visibility and costs in the most cost-effective way. Uh, the question I have is actually for the chair. Uh, and you know, well, I, well, Soam was talking about just capacity and headcount. You know, I noticed. I just did a quick Google search and found that you were appointed after four and a half years of vacancy. Like, I mean, at the level of the CPCB chairman. And so, you know, it just speaks to the fundamental problem we have in state capacity in pretty much every function of government. So we have a dedicated IPF session tomorrow where we will talk about some of this stuff. I mean, the state and market market failures will be the IPF roundtable, and then land to the keynote is going to be on state capacity. So I think um, building on some of the discussions with the chief economic advisor in the previous session, I think my concrete question for you and suggestion is to say, what is the current mechanism for economic expertise within CPCB? I mean, do you have a panel of experts, a panel of advisors? Do you have economic advisors who are permanently inside? And what would be useful ways that can mean that we can help you uh, as an IPF, as a forum, uh, for basically curating the evidence and providing technical inputs? Not because I suspect there's a lot of technical expertise from an environmental perspective, but not necessarily the same amount of economic expertise. Um, and yeah, so. And actually, I would you. broaden that just to add that beyond just the IPF, which meets you know once a year at least in the current format, there are of course a range of economic think tanks like NCER and others in Delhi who can very easily provide you a kind of backdrop uh, to your thinking about economic issues. And if, if this kind of work needs to be done, there's so there are a whole range of other people who would be more than happy, I suspect, to provide uh, input and advice on this. Thank you very much for the talk. We'll come back to that. Uh, just last Hi. two, maybe. We're running I'm, out of time. I'm Shanti, and I'm from IDF. Sorry, uh, Mr. Pati, I think given that this is such an interesting session, uh, and we can squeeze time out of the coffee break. So let's please go on till about 11, 15, 11, 20. We'll squeeze a little time out of lunch as well, and then we'll catch up by then. So please, let's continue. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Shaikh. Um, so uh, it worked in January, and it did not work in April. So presumably, if it is done again, the similar odd even thing, it's not going to work, because people have already adapted to this, uh, this surprise uh, policy announcement. So one wonders whether you know a solution uh, to pollution issue should be more embedded in a sort of a general equilibrium kind of framework. In, instead of just looking at pollution as a as a problem, I think we should also look at the attendant issues like the way we plan our cities, the way we plan our traffic management, uh, the the way we plan our public works. You know, public works is contributing to huge amount of pollution in the NCR area. So I think an embedding of uh, this problem into that larger sort of, you know, city management kind of uh, issue would be uh, perhaps more useful uh, in terms of policy making, which is more coherent. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Taking on what he just now mentioned, um, I think m many families in Delhi have already adapted. Most most of them have gone for buying a second vehicle just to uh, suit their requirements. And another thing which I think policymakers should take in mind is what is the cost of pollution? Because if I just look at my surroundings, I live in South Delhi, my children who were fine until few years back started on nebulization which was seasonal. Mm -hmm. But now it's a regular thing. They need to be nebulized on a regular basis. So what happens next? So will the policymakers wake up now or maybe up to... Uh, 
after some time when certain fatal accidents do happen. from Institute of Economic Growth. Uh, first point I want to make is this talk about using market-based instruments instead of command and control. I think it must be 20 years old. I mean, we have been discussing this for I don't know how many years, NIPP one time, committees. I, 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 I just wonder, is it that the, within the government there is recognition, but there is really no move, nothing? The nearest we have come to this is, I think, in the area, area of energy, because high energy using plants, now there is a scheme of some sort of trading with a cap and trade in terms of energy efficiency. I forget the name, but it's, uh, the program is on. But even there, the actual amount of trading that has taken place, I think, is very limited. So first point is, so what's new? Of course, we know that market-based instrument will be better, but what is the new thing to be done, really? Is it that the, from the government side there is no initiative, or is it the government does not realize the importance of this, or is it that the, there is really market-based instrument really do not work? I, I, I want the authors to come. Second point is, of course, the command and control or taxes, these are okay, but there is always the other option available which we call informal regulation. And the mention was mentioned there that in Maharashtra, now all the plants, some sort of starring system was being done. I think earlier, Center for Science and Environment in the Green Leaf, Green Leaf uh, program in which it was done. And uh, there is a paper by uh, 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 Gupta Golder uh, where we uh, made some assessment and showed that uh, uh, it did have an impact in terms. So I was just wondering, why only Maharashtra? If it is such an important thing that by rating the plants and creating awareness on the people, you could put some pressure on the highly polluting plants to improve because it becomes known to the people. I don't know how much it's really been, how many hits have been there in that website. How many people have really found out which plant is doing? This is, I think, an issue. But assuming that the bare people. But why only Maharashtra? This is again a question to the authors. What is stopping other state pollution control board to do it? Because it is now widely recognized that uh, this sort of uh, scheme with the information can become effective in generating informal regulation. Yeah. Um, so I have a, just a related question, I guess, um, which is that uh, we've seen a lot of really interesting stuff on supply. Uh, and we've also seen things on monitoring and incentives to avoid detection. Um, I'd be interested to understand what the demand side is for pollution reduction and whether there are movements in demand in response to various things, whether in fact, uh, you know, what, what is the demand for environmental, uh, you know, pollution control look like in the country? And I guess the other question that I have uh, related to that is, there are visible sources of pollution and invisible sources of pollution. The invisible sources of pollution are potentially in some cases even more deleterious than the visible sources of pollution. And I wonder how, uh, demand for invisible sources of pollution redu reduction sort of operate in the country if you don't have proper information about some of these things. Is it on? Uh, yeah, maybe you could respond. Please. Yeah, yeah maybe Rohini, do you want to say? Anand, the very nice presentation by Anand. Only two, three things I just have done. Did uh, you have quality monitoring station, the area? Is how much area the area is ventilated that depends give you then influence zone of influence of a particular area as accordingly the whether the our stations are inadequate or adequate that is required to be really judged but our as on date Delhi is equipped with all types of instrument equipments and monitoring stations and we are further strengthening it so there will be no dearth of monitoring data but as far as the NCR is concerned the 2013 study of the uh, that PUC center carried out by uh, by CPCB. This is a continuous process, and now the, there is no loopholes in those centers. Everything is satellite connected, and all data. Whenever you are entering, one is entering for pollution check. It will go to that thing, and it can be called it is a success story, and not a bad story. And uh, this is that there are two uh, two three things and. Uh, 
for this terrific program with the uh, our uh, environment <coughs> protection act that also speaks of the environmental statement there is a statement where is the industries are supposed to give you the transparent information to the public and through which if it is adapted we can we should also think of giving not only always the penalty but the incentives that is also an important aspect that we are not really uh, uh, trying to plug the gaps no there are some good work we are doing that is also required to be carried out and uh, somehow intellectual forum is not trying that environment belongs to all and we all need to participate in this program for environmental protection and uh, it is our goal also that uh, environment is uh, should be good and the environmental economics the loss that part is really a uh, issue that we need to tackle how is the economic loss due to environmental pollution that uh, is uh, one of the aspects uh, we can also think uh, in this uh, thing and in terms of uh, that uh, paying charging industries for regulation we are also already having the water cess and that the industries uh, those who are uh, water intensive they are paying water levy to the uh, state government as well as the central government that is also there and uh, what even the lot of talks have been there in the what even talk but as scientist whatever the sum of the number of the vehicles are withdrawn from the road there will be pollution reduction pollution load reduction that no one can deny mathematically it is true that there will be pollution load reduction and the concentration of course and uh, <coughs> if you see the larger conclusion is there somebody told you always the that you give the decongestion fast traffic confidence among the public that was the other aspect that we have gained in those in those odd even days at least i have the confidence that i will reach to my workplace in certain time that means i will be able to put more efforts for my organization that is also an economic benefit that is the, that odd even has given us so we need to think how far we progress ourselves how much car we need to have how much buildings we have how much the population density we should keep on increasing those aspects need to be controlled at simultaneously if we really want a sustainable city because people, just one minute sir one example recently i was uh, <coughs> i was lucky to visit um, beijing my dear participants they have not allowed a 0.1% growth in their population those who are living in the beijing area not added in single vehicle in that in the beijing area they have already marked the number one vehicle by vehicle number ending with number one it will not apply on monday Num vehicle number ending with two it will not apply on tuesday so likewise every day they are maintaining that's why they are able to achieve this success we talk about us the green us the particulate is a problem because their top soil is acidic and whatever anthropogenic activity they cause that is also acidic that is creating problem but in our case in tropical temperate region our top soil is alkaline and it is had the opportunity for neutralization so this much of people is dying as compared to us that is not significantly correct for in their condition thank you thank you doctor thank you so um yeah. Let me just make a few more scattered comments in response, and uh, then I can add in. So, uh, thank you to both the discussants. Just a couple of things. I think I pick up on what Soam said. So, I just wanted to clarify that there's a difference between um, kind of staffing or resourcing, uh, staffing constraints and resources. So, exactly as Dr. Saha said, I think the CPCB and the State Pollution Control Boards have done an excellent job of raising resources through different types of cesses. So in addition to water cess, if you go to the states, they all have 
um, different cesses, and so actually the financial condition of a lot of SPCBs is in very good condition. What they have a very difficult time is staffing, so we work quite closely with the Gujarat Pollution Control Board, and I think they increased the number of scientists uh, by 100, but it was literally a three or four year process to get it through the system. So. I think probably what there needs to be more of a recognition is of actually the importance of people, both technical economists and others. Um, and that seems to be a lot of the constraint, not money per se. Uh, coming to the question on uh, crop burning, I think one of the big issues in general uh, is source apportionment studies. So there's been a lot of work, excellent work by CPCB and others, but that's certainly part of I think what we need to do as we improve monitoring is to understand sources. So certainly crop burning seasonally is an important source. Whether it is the most important source, I think we don't know yet. Uh, in terms of responses, I think you raise another important question, which is coordination across states. So we know crop, bo crop burning affects Delhi, but it's coming from Haryana, Punjab, UP, and if anything, crop burning now is increasing in other states. I think the other point it raises is one thing that we often fail to recognize is that if you want to take pollution control seriously, we're going to live in a more expensive world. and that just needs to be, you know, we need to raise the money, we need to spend it. So a lot of the responses right now have, uh, apart from for very small farmers, have been of the kind of penalties and fines, which you don't have the, you don't have the ability to enforce in any case on the ground. So I think what, if it is to work, what you have to recognize is that you're going to have to pay farmers a lot of money. Labor has become very expensive. Burning is the cheapest option, especially because the time is very low. And partly this interacts with other constraints. So because Water is a problem, um, you know, you, ha you start sowing late, so you have less time between crops. So I think in some sense it's unfortunately or fortunately a problem you need to throw money at. And I think we haven't had the switch right now of saying that we're just going to give farmers, you know, whatever, happy cedars or other ways of uh, decropping that. In terms of um, coming to another question on just um, what would you do if odd and even doesn't work, I. To some extent, I agree with Dr. Saha that while it didn't potentially raise pollution, it did, or it even did play a very important role of raising awareness. I think that raised the problem, and I think it potentially gave the Delhi government some political, um, you know, one political place to bring up pollution. And that, I think, was probably a long-lasting value, which is not captured in this, but I think going to also what Nat said is those are the kind of political economy issues that may be more long-lasting as we're going forward. I think one thing which comes in the, again in the back to market-based mechanisms is congestion pricing. It's a difficult thing to enforce in a city like Delhi, but I think there are ways now that we have um, you know, technology, you have a certain number of toll passes. A lot of the traffic in Delhi is actually traffic going from Noida to Gurgaon, so it's just passing through Delhi and it's passing through points. So I think, again, thinking seriously about congestion pricing would probably be a more sustainable way than uh, odd and even. I think coming to the question of what's new about market-based instruments, I think one place where we are beginning to see at least some discussion, and uh, Mr. Parihar would certainly know the current status better, is one key problem that India has is that it hasn't really moved to making pollution something that can be addressed through civil penalties. If you look at the Air and Water Act, there's a lot of emphasis on thinking of it as something that needs criminal penalties. This raises the cost. It is exactly what Anand showed in the last graph. If you want to not do criminal penalties, all you can do is disconnect or close, uh, close firms if you say the cost is too high. My impression is the, the government is moving to introduce uh, financial penalties and some of the amendments of acts. I think that would be a welcome step that could actually make a lot of this uh, feasible. And then finally, Tarun, to pick up on your question, when we've been doing uh, some work with CBP, CPCB and state pollution control boards on looking at industry interest in uh, market mechanisms, I think a key reason for that interest is the arbitrariness with which they see con control and command applying. So certainly an area will be declared as critically polluted, you can't open more plants there, or you can't expand capacity. So I think the predictability of market mechanisms is actually what I think makes it very attractive to industries, and that's the main place we see demand from there. Anand, would you add anything more? Yeah, I think, um, well, there are a lot of comments and I uh, agree with most of them, uh, too many to go through, but I think I agree with everything. I, just a couple of sort of extensions to some of the things uh, people have been saying. So Soam and others have ma made the case about uh, sort of institutional reform, essentially, which includes a big part of that is, is staffing and resources and what are the capacity of our institutions to change. 
I think one discussion that goes with this is uh, what is the direction in which we want uh, to move policy making so that the reform of institutions occurs in a way that lines up with what we want those institutions to be doing uh, tomorrow. Uh, so just as a very simple example, uh, when the US EPA introduced the acid rain program, uh, the number of staff they had regulating uh, SOX, uh, sulfur dioxides and others, fell from about 100 odd, and I, I, maybe Nat knows the number, I was speaking to some people there running it, to four. Uh, and so the question is, when you're thinking about staffing, which direction do you want to go in is going to depend on sort of your view of policy making 10 years down the line, which may require many more resources, it may require less resources, it may require different resources. The second point that I thought was very interesting was this idea of how do we get more people involved in this conversation, which Dr. Saha also made, and, and Soam also made that point. Actually, at the conference that was held uh, two days, the, la the seventh, that was a Niti IO conference. This is a point that the uh, chief, that the uh, that, uh, Justice Swatantra Kumar, uh, who heads the National Green Tribunal, also made, arguing that in fact the Indian Constitution read with Supreme Court judgments uh, would suggest that it's everyone's responsibility to ensure that uh, that air pollution is, is actually minimized. That was more of a theoretical argument, but I think the two examples I gave up there are in some ways an attempt to do that. Both with the market uh, approach and with putting up star ratings, one thing they do is that they make information something that more than just a regulator cares about. If you're competing for stars with your, with your peer group industries, you want to make sure that the data on which that is based is good data. Uh, likewise, if you are trading permits, you want to make sure that the data on which that is based is good data. And when you have things like information interventions uh, of different kinds, uh, that can then start involving the public. Uh, so some of these reforms that have been spoken about for a long time, often in the with the argument of lowering costs and the standard economic arguments, I think one of the, the, the benefits that they do have uh, is greater inclusiveness. The last point, just on scale up, I think there is there is a serious first mover problem uh, in India. I think uh, partly because of risk aversion in the in the setting in which we regulate, but I think once these first steps are taken, there's also a lot of willingness, especially of the states, to to try out new things. So the star rating program in Maharashtra, since it was launched, um, and I don't know about what the state board has got, but I have had uh, three state boards uh, write to me asking whether we can implement something similar. So Odisha is implementing something similar and Rajasthan is implementing something similar uh, and I think uh, Tripura was also interested. So it's not taken very long, it's just taken a few days. On the other hand, it took three years to get that first program started. So I think the delay is, is the first mover. Thank you, Anand. Uh, if Dr. Shah permits, I'll make this about two minutes intervention. Now, uh, concern was, sorry, yeah, please. Uh, Rajesh Chadda, National Council of Applied Economic Research. Very brief, one comment and one suggestion. This is the issue of crop burning uh, also refers to the farmer not being educated about the soil quality going down and hence his costs increasing. So one very simple thing is to do more education to the farmer that this is not cost reducing, this might be cost increasing in fact. My second comment is on, you know, I've been hearing about this odd even um, issue, but uh, did you consider or would you like to consider what happened since 2015 when odd even was introduced and that is the Uber Ola sharing uh, rights. Uh, does it does it have an impact on uh, mm, pollution? Because four people riding, at least three might be avoiding their cars. So maybe there is some discussion which I missed out. Uh, we've noted your observations. Uh, a very important concern was raised about uh, whether or not the regulators uh, are looking at the social cost of uh, air pollution, especially in the context of Delhi. 
let me share with you that there is a specific working group um, in the Ministry of Environment which is looking at this specific uh, aspect of uh, impact of air pollution on health. And they're working with ICMR and a lot of other scientists. And uh, therefore, the, I have to uh, sort of uh, share with you that we are extremely, extremely concerned with this particular aspect. And uh, we would be really happy to get more ideas on the subject, if there are any. Uh, on the issue of uh, uh, civil penalties, uh, Yes, uh, we already moved a proposal uh, which is under discussion in the ministry uh, on uh, the regulators being empowered to also levy uh, civil penalties, fines rather than closing the industries altogether at one go. So that's something which is again uh, under discussion and an active discussion. Um, on the uh, very, very important issue of capacities uh, within uh, the state boards and the Central Pollution Control Board. Yes, uh, there are constraints in terms of manpower, budget, skills, laboratories. Uh, and as uh, Rohini pointed out, there is a large variation among state boards. There are state boards which are fully equipped, uh, very skilled, they've got budget. Manpower, of course, uh, is an issue, takes long. Uh, but there are uh, other state boards which need more support, more hand-holding, especially in the east and northeastern part of the country. And uh, therefore, as uh, Central Pollution Control Board, what we do is to do hand-holding, provide skills, upgrade skills, educate them, get them certifications for the laboratories and for the manpower that we have. On the uh, specific question that is uh, whether or not we have a formal arrangement for uh, involving economists in our discussion on the um, pollution, environmental pollution, well, I have to concede that as of now, there is no formal arrangement. But what we have is a research advisory council in the uh, Central Pollution Control Board, where uh, eminent um, institutions like NIDI, NPL, IIT is there represented. And we'd be very happy to associate um, economists on that particular advisory body to inform our work that we do. and. Uh, uh, we certainly need to be educated on that particular aspect more and more and therefore we would certainly welcome your participation on the research advisory committee i heard the discussion this morning when dr subraman was here and there was a concern that uh, there needs to be a formal arrangement for uh, engaging with uh, experts in the field of economics and uh, what was mentioned was that well maybe informal discussions would also help so i share the same view that informal discussions would certainly help but uh, we can certainly have this formal arrangement within CPCB where uh, the experts could contribute to the research advisory committee. Uh, thank you very much. I have to say that I have personally benefited from this discussion and uh, we wish to carry forward this discussion uh, in the time to come and we will certainly request you to join in with us for discussions in future. Thank you so much.